Welcome, everybody. So glad to see everyone here. Um, welcome to the uh, Lathe of Heaven and other the other sci-fi story that we'll look at, the Orwell um, Lit Talks that we're going to do this summer. Uh, there'll be three of them all together. And we hope uh, that uh, you'll text and get uh, some of your other teammates on uh, the live broadcast. Uh, right now, if you would, uh, hop on the chat. I'd love to know uh, what schools we have in attendance here. Um, so give your school a shout out in the chat. Um, you do have to be a subscriber to the chat. Uh, hopefully your coach told you that uh, you needed to subscribe uh, by yesterday to do that. If not, go ahead and subscribe now and you'll be ready to uh, post questions uh, for the uh, lit talks for next week. So, uh, my name is Jared Stewart. I am a former academic coach. Uh, I also run the social media for uh, Texas Academic Decathlon. Uh, so, if you follow us on Twitter and Instagram, that is me. Uh, in addition to all that, uh, in addition to another day job I have, I'm also a uh, professor of English and a graduate student uh, studying writing and American literature. So, uh, I was really excited uh, last year to uh, have the opportunity to talk about Beeland and all the wonderful murder and mystery of that novel. And this year we get, um, it's, it's still have somebody that kills a lot of people. Uh, instead of, uh, I think about a dozen of Beeland, we get billions here. So uh, still get a little bit of uh, death and destruction as well. So we're going to dive into that today uh, and talk about uh, all the different aspects and themes of Lathe of Heaven, and we'll get through chapters one through five. I hope that you have already uh, read through chapters one through five. Next week, we will do six through the end of the book, and then the last lit talk, we will do the Orwell story and dive into that and kind of pick that apart and talk about how best to prepare uh, for this upcoming season. I do have to say that... Uh, it's been involved with academic decathlon for a very long time and i think this is probably my favorite uh topic they've ever done as far as the interesting music and literature uh, and the science and history uh that is involved so let us go ahead and get started uh last year when i started this uh lit talk uh someone actually asked uh how do i read this book and I, how do i read these books or these stories and prepare for the test. And I thought, man, that's such a good question for people that are new to academic decathlon, maybe just joined the team, your coach thrust a guide and a novel into your hands, hopefully back in uh, May, and said, here, go, go read and study. Uh, and so I wanted to start today by looking at uh, the how best to approach the novel uh, for preparing yourself for the competition season. And so as you're approaching the novel, uh, I would recommend that you read it through first, just kind of just read it through, get a sense of the plot and enjoy the novel because it is a very enjoyable novel. Uh, it's a pretty easy read. Um, if you saw my post, uh, I read it on a plane and on the beach at a undisclosed tropical location. Uh, it's a great beach read, and so it's, it's not a difficult read. You should be able to finish it quite quickly. So just, you know, enjoy it, go through it, enjoy the different aspects of it. Uh, but then on your second read, uh, one of the things I would suggest you do is make note of the recurring themes and ideas. And this is the best for the essay. So if you get a lit topic for essay, uh, knowing the themes, kind of the repeated ideas that kind of show up again and again, that's going to be helpful. We're going to go over some of those themes today uh, that will kind of help prepare you for any kind of essay you'll have. Um, and then after that, we want to talk about uh, looking at the various points uh, that translate uh, into multiple uh, choice questions best. So this would be plot points, uh, major decisions that the characters make, uh, the various character traits that they have, uh, the choices they make, uh, their opinions about each other. Uh, that's that's kind of key. Um, 
any kind of terms or concepts important to the plot. Now here's one where we have lots of dream terms in here. We have lots of sleep terms in here. Uh, that's going to be all fair game for the multiple choice questions. Um, now the other aspect of this, before I get to the last one, uh, is that this, this is going to make this uh, novel somewhat of a challenge, is that reality changes several times throughout the novel. And so each one of these realities, you do kind of need to keep straight in your head. Uh, so take some notes as you're re re uh, reading the book and try to keep straight the different realities as they unfold. Now, I, I think for you, this actually might be a bit easier than, say, someone reading it in the 1970s, 1980s, simply because of the plethora of uh, multidimensional, different timelines, pop culture uh, productions that we've had recently uh, between the multiverse in uh, Spider-Man and uh, The Flash, uh, the various Avengers movies, the various differences of realities, um, trying to think of some other movies, uh, that our brains have been and culturally been trained a little bit better to kind of keep track of all that. Let's see. All right. And so that will take some uh, to get to uh, keep track of. Um, the other thing is going to be the differences between their world and ours. Um, this is not the same world. Obviously, this was uh, the author's kind of prediction of, or possible prediction, I suppose, of kind of where Earth was headed. And we're going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute. Um, and so keeping track of that differences between our worlds, I, I don't know that that would be exactly a multiple choice question, but at the very least, that will kind of train you to look at, oh, this is something really interesting or specific about the world that these characters are inhabiting, uh, the population of Portland that they talk about, um, you know, what countries are at war at that point, etc. And of course, the last one is going to be the epigraphs. I, I would take a moment and make note of those, um, their meaning and connection to the story. Uh, this makes for great discussion points for the team, so I would uh, encourage you to uh, talk about that periodically. Sorry, I'm making a small adjustment to chat here. All right. Now, so now that we talked about approach, uh, so uh, probably on your second read is where we need to kind of begin taking notes in this using either post-it notes, those little tabs work well, um, or just keeping handwritten notes somewhere that works well as well. All right, so let's talk about themes. Um, themes in the Lathe of Heaven. So first, we have, obviously, this is very dystopian. Uh, the dystopian restrictions of reality, and, and this is something that uh, a lot of science fiction has in common. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of very si close similarities between 1984, if you've read 1984, and Lathe of Heaven. Uh, and if you've already read the guide, you, you know that uh, George Orr, the main character of the book uh, is inspired by George Orwell's name uh, and the author of 1984. Uh, and so dystopian, we think about dystopia, if you've already finished chapters one through five, those should have kind of popped out at you, right? How crowded it is, the lack of choice, um, you know, idea of starvation, of scarce, scarcity, um, kind of the drabness and boringness of life. Sorry, I forgot to silence my phone. Um, and so looking at those dystopian elements, that is something you need to kind of keep track of, uh, might make it good if you're, if you're a highlighter color coded person, uh, that maybe you color code, uh, pink is, you know, this dystopian aspects throughout the novel so that you can kind of quickly find those, uh, those make a, a great thing to kind of keep track of. Um, the other thing you want to think about it with this theme of dystopian restrictions of reality, you want to think about how it limits each of the characters in their own way, uh, and also how it serves the plot. And, you know, I, I don't want to spoil too much of this book, but I, I know quite a few of you have already um, probably finished the book. Uh, but if you haven't, I, I don't want to completely spoil it to you. But 
there are those dystopian elements act within the plot as a reason for change to happen. Uh, they kind of spur on the change uh, brought about. And so they do serve that purpose. And so you need to kind of think about both for Dr. Haber and for uh, George Orr, what those dystopian aspects, why their reason for change exists. Okay. Um, the next thing, if you've already read the first five chapters, hopefully you notice that the perspective changes with each chapter, uh, that we see kind of the world through George Orr's kind of perspective. Then we get Dr. Haber, then it goes back to uh, Orr, then we get uh, Heather's uh, perspective, and it keeps changing. Uh, and so how that experience of change and reality are different between the various characters, uh, one of the first things you'll notice through the first couple of chapters is the experience of hypnosis and dreaming, how it's different for George Orr than it is for Dr. Haber, because Orr doesn't remember anything. And so it's just like he is out and then he wakes up. So he doesn't remember the middle part, whereas Dr. Haber is actually the one directing through the middle part. So he has a full memory of that. And so how that perspective change changes our understanding of reality and what's going on. Um, the next is the Infernal Machine Tech Humanity. If you've read the guide already, they mentioned this. Uh, one of the kind of the interesting parts of the Infernal Machine aspect of Lathe of Heaven is that for the machine to truly be quote unquote infernal, it needs a human component. It needs ore to become incredibly dangerous. So on its own, the technology is rather benign. With ore, it becomes deadly and destructive. Um, and so that's something that might make, might make a nice uh, essay if you get a prompt on lot, uh, the lit there that kind of directs you in that direction. Um, but it's also something to talk about maybe with your teams, kind of go over this idea of Orr's kind of role in this idea of the technology being, you know, damaging, scary, etc. Okay. Um, Next theme is going to be control. Uh, that's going to be a big thing between Haber and Orr is who's actually in control. Uh, the idea of between action versus passive. Um, there's this great scene uh, in uh, where he's in the subway, where Orr is in the subway. And he's literally kind of at the mercy of the crowd because there's so many people. And it's a great moment where we get his very passivity and how he's just being pushed and pulled and even lifted up off the ground uh, like he has no control of his own life because of everyone around him. And, and that kind of speaks to a kind of a greater theme within the book. Um, and last, we get kind of the historical context of this book for when it was written in the 70s, that historical anxiety of civilization decline, which if you know anything about the history of the 1970s, yeah, there was a lot of reasons to be pessimistic. Uh, we were just kind of understanding the damage uh, done to the environment uh, by human action. We we're trying to find ways to reverse that. Uh, poverty seemed to not be abating as, as, as much as we had hoped. Uh, overpopulation was a concern. Uh, hopefully you noticed that from the very beginning of the book. They talk about, uh, you know, Portland being having millions and millions of people in it. Uh, hopefully, you went and checked the current population of Portland today and saw that you know uh, nowhere near that. Um, but they were concerned about overpopulation and the scarcity that would bring. Uh, they were concerned about crime. The crime was kind of at one of its peaks. Uh, there was this you know technology and state and oppression um, had kind of always been around. I mean, 1984 uh, Orwell. Uh, but we were, you know, seeing the state progress in many areas of the world uh, to use technology to keep track of people. We see that a little bit in the book. And, of course, drug use was a big issue, which is kind of where we start the book uh, with George Orr, you know, misusing drugs in order to stop uh, his power from happening. And so the, the anxiety of all of this led to the very dystopian view of the world. Um, that lathe of heaven presents. And so keeping track of that, uh, the dystopian aspect, but also historical anxiety aspect are kind of interlinked. So kind of keep track of that as you go through the book. Let's talk about characters. 
it looks like there may be something wrong with the chat. Or... So let's take a look at the chat. So sorry if, if you're having trouble with the chat. Um, my apologies. Uh, I'll look at that before next week. Um, so let's take a look at the characters. Uh, George Orr, Grassman. I, I did put a job on here because I feel like that says something about their interaction with him and how uh, two of the other characters kind of treat George Orr initially. Um, you know, George is not a blue collar person. Uh, he, you know, he has a white collar job, but yet Dr. Haber and Heather still look down on him, kind of treat him dismissively, um, which there's some analysis to be done there. Uh, so we have George Orr who has this problem with dreaming uh, that he believes that his dreams change reality. And of course, uh, by chapter five, we find out uh, that that is an absolute reality. Uh, then we have Dr. Haber, uh, who is a doctor who specializes in dreaming, uh, which is why George Orr is referred to him. And hopefully you've got the impression from Haber so far that he's very confident that he kind of feels like he sh is always in control of everything, like he should be in control of everything. Sometimes that control is phony. Sometimes it's real. Uh, we get Heather. Uh, and she is also someone who feels like she is in control that is also forceful she looks down on george Orr when she first meets him of course that obviously will change over time um she also kind of treats herself like she's above it all uh and that will kind of fall away as well as we go through the book and of course the last big character of this that we don't get it in, through chapter five yet is the aliens or the sea turtles now the interesting thing about the aliens is that you know, later when we actually get to them after, uh, I think it's chapter six, uh, or after chapter six that we actually begin to talk about them in uh, any great detail. Uh, and again, spoiler alert, sorry, is that they are essentially a creation of Orr. So to what extent they're just an extension of him and his inner thoughts, uh, that is something we'll deal with probably next week. All right, so let's walk us through the various chapters here um, of the book. And so we start off in the beginning of the book uh, with something that's it's kind of really amorphous. Uh, it talks about this uh, jellyfish and drifting. Um, and there's this line, the light shines through it and the dark enters it. It's, it's not there, it's there, but it's not there. And Again, this, this acts as kind of an entire uh, metaphor for dreams, that they, they exist, yet they don't exist. Uh, that's something we'll come back to again and again and again uh, about how real dreams are. Uh, for George, they're very real. For the reality of the change, they're very real. Um, and so we get that contrast at the very beginning of the book, of the jellyfish kind of floating through the ocean and then the crashing on the rock, the reality. And so this this contrast between what doesn't exist and what absolutely does exist. Um, and then, of course, we wake up into this kind of where he's kind of coming out of this drug-induced state, uh, being helped by paramedics. And so we can kind of take that uh, as a metaphor for what's about to come, this, this question of what's real, what's believable. Um, we can also take it as kind of his brain just processing nothingness and, and drug-induced thoughts. Um, his eyelids had been burned away so that he could not close his eyes and the light entered into his brain searing. So that, that you know, uh, it's not literal. Uh, it is him waking up and kind of light being shone in his eyes, trying to get him to uh, wake up and come into the real world. And so... We get this extended metaphor, we get the dr drug haze, the confusion, he's not sure what's going on. Um, the doorman is there, the elevator guard uh, is there, the paramedics are there, and they're trying to kind of figure out 
you know, what do you take? What's going on? Who's, who's part of the use? Uh, the other important aspect of chapter one, which is not very long, uh, is kind of this dystopia building that we kind of get an idea of that first off that everyone has a drug card that they can use that they can get a hold of whatever they want, just, you know, certain amounts, which, okay, that seems weird. Uh, we, we get, we are told about starvation and lack of protein. So, okay, we're getting an idea that this is a society in trouble. Great. And that takes us to chapter two. Uh, and from chapter two, we go straight into Dr. Haber's perspective. Uh, and we get a description of his office. We get the mural, which becomes very important. Um, we get a sense of kind of his place in society, which also is very important because that uh, is a change later. Uh, we were told that he, you know, is in one of these windowless walls with a big photographic mural of Mount Hood, um, and so he's in a windowless office. So that right away tells us that he's not in a very nice office. It's probably very cramped, um, very oppressive. Um, we also get this interesting line, uh, a few paragraphs in, uh, right after he's talking uh, to uh, Penny. Penny is the name, uh, where he's talking about all the noise. And he says the real trick was to learn how not to hear them, meaning the other people. The only solid partitions left were inside the, the head. And so we get this idea that the everyone's kind of, in, it's so crowded and such a uh, oppressive society that, that they live in that the only partitions left, the only solid things were inside the head, meaning that was the only place that you could keep others out or kind of build up walls, which is interesting because he's about to be responsible for invading uh, George Orr's partitions, basically taking over those partitions. So uh, we get a really nice uh, moment there, kind of contrast between what uh, Dr. Haber knows is correct versus what he knows is wrong. So we get more uh, dystopian world building throughout this. We talk about the greenhouse effect and and overpopulation, etc. But then we get into the idea once or arrives. We begin talking about sleeps and dreams, and Dr. Haber explains sleep and dreams to to Orr, but he's also explaining it to us, the reader about their conception of dreams uh, and sleep. And the other thing you should pick up from this chapter is just how sure Haber is of everything. He, he is literally in the room with Orr for just a few minutes and he already has him figured out, already knows where we're headed. I know. Um, and at one point, uh, when he's asking him, you know, how do you sleep? I sleep well. Do you have bad dreams? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of. Uh, and then he goes on. It was an easy guess for me, Mr. Orr. They generally send me the dreamers. And so he, he's like, yeah, I, I, I know where this is going. Sleep and dreaming are my field. Okay, now I can proceed to the next educated guess, which is that you use the phenobarb to suppress dreaming, but found that with habituation, the drug had less and less dreams for effect, right? And he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he keeps going on. Like, oh, yeah, I know everything you said. And then at one point, a, little, a few paragraphs after that, Haber's like, Haber opened his mouth and shut it again. So often he knew what his patients were going to say and could say it for them better than they could say it for themselves. So this man is so confident that I know what you're going to say. In fact, I probably could explain your thoughts better than you can. That should tell you something about the ego, the hubris of Haber. And it really sets up the character nicely for his actions later. I know better. I know exactly what's needed. Um, and so then it's not much of a surprise when he actually uh, uses his power in a very way. The other thing we get here is this belief versus disbelief. And Or is afraid to kind of tell him. It's like, yeah, I have dreams. Okay, right. But like, if I tell you, you're not going to believe me. It's like, ah, oh, you know, tell me. I, whatever. 
And then after he says the whole story uh, about his aunt and how he dreamed her to death, he says, I'm not in the judgment business. I'm after facts. And he says, I've seen other dreams. I record them. I can measure them. They're real. So whereas Orr comes in, knowing his dreams can have a real effect, treats them as dreams. But Haber says, they're not just dreams. They're real. There's something I can measure. There's something I can see. And what I see, I can study. But yet doesn't believe at all yet that or can change reality with his dreams. And so we get this idea of belief versus disbelief. Now, here is in this first five chapters, we get this a couple of times, belief versus disbelief, because Orr has to you know, kind of explain this to Haber, but then he has to explain it to Heather. And in both times, like, you're not going to believe me. And both of them, Heather and Haber, have interesting reactions to that. And in fact, they're, they're somewhat similar. Uh, in their reactions. Pay attention to that as you're reading chapter two. Another part that comes about when he's talking about the ant. He tells the story about the ant, dreams her into a car crash, she dies. And Haber asks her, but there was nothing to show that to prove it. And Orr says, no, nothing. She hadn't been. Nobody remembered that she had been, except me, and I was wrong now. This idea that two realities can exist at the same time, I was wrong. Now, there's an interesting thing there, I was wrong. And if you'll notice, if you go to the book uh, where this is, and again, I apologize, uh, I, I would normally like to give you page numbers here, but uh, I was in a little bit of a fender bender last night, and my book is in my car, which is no longer with me. Um, but there was a point in the book, it's, it's about halfway through a chapter two, if you can find it. And I was wrong, period. Now. And there's this idea of I was wrong. Well, he wasn't wrong. She existed. She had lived there. And so we have this idea of I was wrong. Did he do something wrong? And that's going to be something else that repeats over and over through this novel. Is or responsible? for his dreams. Did he do something wrong? Was he wrong in the sense that I, I, I messed up? And of course, at the very end of this, he dreams. Um, by the way, we get another little uh, interesting twist to this idea of like, is uh, or wrong? Um, the moral question of this a little later at that, um, where Haber asks him, like, well, why are you scared? And Orr says, because I don't want to change things. Who am I to meddle with the way things go? Who am I to meddle with the things that go? That's that moral question is why, why should I get to change things? That is Orr's perspective. And, and the guide goes into some of the philosophical questions that we're not going to dive into here, uh, but probably will make great fodder for team dinner discussions in the future. But who am I to meddle with things? Versus, we already know Haber's response to this. Me. I, I, I can. I'm sure of everything. I can fix you. And then eventually we get Haber's choosing. I can fix everything. So then we get the mural change, which is at the very end of chapter two. Um, before that, we get the very kind of violent hypnosis attack on Orr, where he's you know, grabbing him by the throat and putting him into hypnosis. Um, but then at the very end, we get the horse, the change of the mountain to the horse. Uh, and it's the first reality change that we actually see in the book. Uh, Orr tells us about uh, the one with the ant, but we actually see this one change. The we see we know it was a mountain, uh, but uh, now we it's a horse, um, and then we get some inclination that Haber sees it too, although Orr isn't sure. 
All right, let's take a look at chapters three and four. Okay. So with chapter three, we now go back to Orr's perspective. And so we've, we've been through a dream session in Haber's perspective, but we have been through a dream session with Orr's perspective. With Orr's perspective, we don't get the dream at all because remember Haber makes it so he doesn't really recall that part, so that's gone. All we get is Orr retelling the dream. Okay. Um, at the beginning of chapter three, is that great scene in the subway about the control where he's packed in, uh, he can't reach a strap, so he's just kind of, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, ridden a very crowded subway, but we're just kind of crammed in. Uh, this one is even more crowded probably than would be allowed uh, today, where you just have no control, you can't even move. Uh, and he's that way. He's being basically pushed and pulled and up and down with the moves of humanity around him. And it's, it's a great kind of uh, physical manifestation of his lack of control. Uh, and so chapter three, we get uh, a lot of the uh, weather aspect of this, uh, the climate change aspect of this, the different cities, the new cities, the you know, overpopulation uh, that was talked about. Um, we get the war, we get talk of the war with uh, Pakistan and uh, uh, India, et cetera. And so uh, we get a discussion with that between Haber and or and then we get the next chain, which is the change of the mural again, this time from the horse to the way Mount Hood looks at that moment in history. Remember, the old mural was an old version of Mount Hood back before the climate had changed and everything. But this is the new. It's, it's all brown and drab, uh, not much snow at the top, not much vegetation, etc. So we get the change. Um, and so again, we kind of get a feel that now we're getting more an idea that Haber knows what's going on, that he's essentially testing kind of the reality of what he saw last time. And we get the suspicion of Haber. Or is now thinking, wait, did he tell me to change the mural? Or did I just change the mural? Or what did he tell me to do? We also get an interesting repeat of something in chapter three that was in chapter two. And that is the idea of locks. If you look, uh, probably should be a couple of pages into chapter three. Uh, if we can just find the keys to all the locks, this is Haber talking, the power of dreaming alone is quite undreamt of. Previously, uh, Orr had talked about his condition is finding the drugs finding the right key to kind of uh, close it. Uh, close this off. And Haber is talking about finding right keys to unlock it. And so there is that duality of Orr's purpose versus Haber's purpose. Um, and then as we go through it, we get uh, there's another interesting uh, Haber quote about ego. We all need that ego boost we get from daydreams. Yeah, I don't know that Haber needs a lot of ego boosting, uh, but he starts talking about, and this kind of predicts where we're probably going to go next, where Haber's talking about uh, the daydreams of being a hero, an astronaut, uh, saving people, etc. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. And of course, later we'll see that he gets or to dream him into a better station of societies kind of puts him in that spot, so we get a little bit of a prediction there. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move on to um, so the last line of chapter three uh, really shows us or suspicion. Uh, he knew, he did see the first dream change reality. He saw the change. He believes me. I am not insane. Now, that's the key part here the end of every chapter three, you'll notice that Orr's first thought is not the danger of what Haber is doing. 
it is that he's not insane. Like, I'm not making this up. Later in chapter four, we'll see that he has, it, it turns away from a selfish thing to something like, wait, this isn't good. Yeah, it's great that I'm not insane. But this is becoming dangerous. Uh, we see that moving on to chapter four, which is a great uh, segue to chapter four, which is where we get uh, the introduction of Heather um, and the lawyer. And I guess the last name, I would probably say uh, Lalash. Yeah, Lalash, Lalash, something like that. Um, she's a lawyer. And we get her perspective here. Uh, very beginning of chapter four, there is some repetition that I, I do want to point out to you that I do think is meaningful to her character. And it says, there she sat. Poisonous, hard, shiny, and poisonous, waiting, waiting. That re repetition of poisonous twice suggests that there are two meanings that, that uh, were being given there. Uh, and so to think about what those two meanings of poisonous might be. Then we get a repeat of waiting, meaning that she's kind of waiting on something, and we're not quite sure who she's waiting on until we find out uh, that it's or here in just a minute, but it's like she's just sitting there waiting, almost like she's prey, right? Um, and then, of course, the very next line after that, and the victim came. And so it initially places or as the victim of her. Uh, as we go through the book, if you've already finished the book, you'll understand that not at all. In fact, it ends up being the other way to some extent. Um, but the launch considers him a born victim. He, she looks down on Orr, just like Haber did, and kind of treats him and dismisses him very much like Haber did. Um, gives him hair like a little girl's, brown and fine. So that's kind of diminishing Orr in her eyes. And so they have the conversation. We get to that same conversation um, of, about whether he believes, you know, whether you'll believe me, you know, I'm a mental case, etc. Um, you know, and it, there's another interesting part in that conversation where she is talking to him uh, and he tells her like, okay, if I tell you, uh, this is what you're going to think. And she says, well, go on. She said it last sharply. He was quite right about what she was thinking, but damned if she was going to admit it. Again, that stubbornness to let or have any control of this relationship, relationship or in this conversation. Like, yeah, you're right, but I'm not telling you you're right. I'm actually going to do the opposite of what I think, just to, so that you're not proven right. So in a lot of ways, uh, Haber and Lalash, Lalash are similar in the way they interact with Orr, at least in the beginning. And then we get to the idea, we go through that, of we find out that he now has a cabin, that uh, Haber has had him dream that he has this cabin to get away from. Uh, and so we're like, okay, well, Haber's using it to make Orr's life better. Great. Uh, okay, maybe we don't think so harshly about Haber now. And the great relationship, like, well, why shouldn't you have a cabin? I, you know, well, no, it's it's not that I have a cabin. It's that we're changing reality, right? Um, and so we get that new change. We find out he has a cabin. Uh, we get the idea, can you come and look, you know, come observe. Really, Lalash Heather is not really all that interested in this until we get to a point uh, towards the very end of chapter five, where he utters a word that piques her interest. And that is the word experimental. And as a lawyer, experimental, possible lawsuit, possible case, right? And she says, experimental purposes? Is he? What? The machine you talked about, is it experimental? Has it HEW uh, approval? What have you signed? Any releases? Anything beyond the VTT form? Like, she goes straight into lawyer mode, and all of a sudden now she's interested in him for what his case can offer her. Interest, some kind of case. Um, and so again, we have a lot of similarities between Orr and uh, Lalash Heather here because 
they're both treating or excuse me a lot of uh, similarities between Haber and Heather Lalash here in that they're both treating or as what or can do for them how they can use him for their own purposes again Heather will change Haber will not and so that that gets us to chapter five and so with chapter five we get we're back to Haber's perspective but it's a new perspective Haber has changed now not in his character he still is very egotistical and wants to be in control and still is suspicious but now he's in charge now he has this institute that was created he is has a window his station in the world has completely changed and so we find out that Heather is there to observe. He's expecting her. He doesn't know that uh, Heather and George know each other. And we get this conflict of wills. Both who think they're in control and both who are hiding something. Now, Haber knows that she's hiding something. He can kind of tell, or at least he thinks he does. Whether he can or cannot, I don't know, but he thinks he can. Heather. We don't, we don't, this is really from Haber's perspective. We don't really get Heather's interiority of kind of what she thinks of him. We get a little bit of clue from the way she treats him. But we get this conflict of two wills, both trying to act professional. And so that should be the tension you're feeling at the beginning of chapter five is both of them trying to get away with something here. We also get a modified explanation of how the machine works as we go through here. Um, I would suggest that you read this and then contrast it with the way that uh, Haber explains it to George and see where the differences are. Because there are some significant differences between the two, uh, the way he's presenting it to the lawyer versus the way he presents it to the patients. Now, there's a reason for that. In fact, there are multiple reasons for that. So take a look at that. One of the other things that I think is interesting about Chapter 5 and Haber's perspective is that even though he knows that things have changed because of a war, he still is talking as if things have always been this way. So his brain is still filling in the gaps of the story and the way he talks about everything's always, never, as if they always have been that way or never had done that before. I've done this many, many times, etc. When in reality, this is less than a week old. And he knows that. But yet, even he kind of slips into this idea of a new perspective. One of the other things to notice from chapter five is the amount of sound that plays a role in here. Um, when she comes in, he talks about sh her snapping and clicking all the uh, handbag noises, her shoes, her jewelry, etc. We get the keep of the recorder uh, in chapter five. That plays a special role as far as annoying Haber, um, and you know, kind of think about why that is. And then we finally get, in Chapter 5, full admission from Haber that he knows what's going on. That he knows what he's going to do, or what he's been doing. Um, we get the change. We introduce the plague that kills billions of people that Orr just dreamed up and ended those lives. We get Orr recounting his dream that he's burying these bodies. Again, kind of questioning that idea, is this Orr's fault? I mean, he clearly thinks so. He's He dreams he's the one bearing them. But we get Haber fully admitting that, yes, I know what's going on here. Uh, and because he sees the recognition in Heather's eyes, that she has recognized something has changed. And he is very ready at some point to attack her. He keeps thinking, it's like, how do I keep her from saying anything? I, I can't let this get out. Uh, thankfully, she plays it off, that plays along, and because she's still confused, and they kind of end amicably. He gets her out of the room. Um, but at this point, at the end of Chapter 5, we get the very last line of him. He's you know got her out. He finishes up with George. He destroys the tape recorder, so there's no record of any of this. He opens the drawer to a bottle of uh, liquor of, of 
forget what it is, bourbon, that's right, uh, a bottle of bourbon that didn't exist prior to population decline because of scarce resources, and he toasts himself, and he toasts to a better world, raising his glass to an empty room. Um, and right there, that's kind of the culmination of everything that we've learned about Dr. Haber. His ego, his idea that he can fix everything, that he knows best, uh, that he's toasting, that he's changing the world, that he just eliminated billions of people. Um, essentially, uh, if you want a nice Avengers reference, going all Thanos on the world uh, to get rid of uh, overpopulation. So, And that's where we end at Chapter 5. Uh, so we know that Haber knows. We have a pretty good inkling that Heather knows, that she understands what's going on. And of course, Orr is suspicious, obviously, because that's why he set all this up. And so from here on out, we're going to get the conflict between these three people of, obviously, Orr wanting to stop this, Haber not wanting to stop, or being trapped, Heather trying to help, not really being able to. And so as we look forward, uh, I, I really, as you're reading over this next week, uh, it's chapter six through the end of the book, uh, really stop and examine uh, Orr's guilt, his trying to regain control, and how he tries to do that, the unintended consequences that come about because of what Haber's doing. Uh, that's one of the kind of the key things that happens after this is each dream has some unintended consequences because the way or fixes things is not always a direct line. And so then the next dream has to fix the last unintended consequence and kind of the chaos that that ensue, uh, involves. Uh, and then last, I want you to very look at the motivations of Heather. We already saw that her first motivation was, okay, this might be a juicy case, something just kind of stick my teeth into that you know might give me a promotion, who knows. But after that, we need to start looking at the motivations and how that changes, not just how she changes, but how that how her role in the story changes after this. So take a look at that as you go through. All right, well, that is the first of these. I will do my best to get the chat fixed by next week so we can have time for questions. Uh, to I'm happy to ans answer them next week. I'll make sure the chat is up and working um, and visible for me. Uh, so Bring your questions. If you have questions this week about the first five chapters, bring it for next week, and uh, we'll we'll kind of start off the uh, broadcast next week with questions about the first five chapters or anything you're confused about or ideas you have about the book. I'd love to hear them. It's a fascinating book to kind of talk about. Uh, so, but thank you for listening. Make sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at AcadecTX. Uh, also, make sure to follow the USAD accounts on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and if you're on Facebook, too, great. Um, but mostly Twitter uh, and Instagram for both uh, organizations who stay up to date at all the wonderful things happening uh, with Texas Academic Triathlon and USAD. Thanks so much.